This video will illustrate how we represent orientation um, using the 321 Tate Bryan rotation sequence, the 313 Euler rotation sequence, and using quaternions. And we're going to consider two illustrative maneuvers. The first maneuver that we're going to we'll consider um, is to take our solid body and roll by pi over 2, then pitch by pi over 2 to arrive at a final orientation like that. And the second maneuver that we'll consider um, is to pitch by pi over 2, and then yaw by pi over 2, arriving at the same final condition. And we're first going to use rotation sequences, and then we'll use quaternions. The rotation sequences will be considered as intrinsic rotation sequences. Um, and so at any given moment in a rotation sequence, um, we're going to apply the next rotation um, based on the orientation uh, that we arrived to at the end of the previous orientation. So for instance, with a 3-2-1 Tate Bryan rotation sequence, we're going to yaw some and then we're going to pitch some from where we uh, where we left off after the first one and then we're going to roll some where we left off after after the second rotation. And so um, this is an intrinsic rotation sequence. We're starting with 3, 2, 1 Tate Bryan as considered as an intrinsic rotation sequence as is common. And um, the, uh, the three rotations, um, I'll denote alpha, beta, and gamma in order. Um, so the first rotation um, is the yaw. The second rotation is the pitch by beta. And the third rotation is the roll by gamma. And we're going to start uh, from the zero, zero, zero orientation, which I'll uh, represent like this, and that might be taken as northeast down of your x, y, and z axes, where we're going to fix the x, y, and z axes to the airplane um, in the uh, right-handed sense. So if this is a right-handed coordinate system with x, y, and z in the thumb, the first finger, and the second finger, um, <coughs> we're going to fix that to the center of mass of the aircraft with x pointing out the nose of the aircraft, y pointing out to the right wing of the aircraft, and z pointed down. And a uh, positive rotation corresponds to right wing down um, for positive rotation about x, positive rotation about y corresponds to nose up, and positive rotation about z corresponds corresponds to nose to the left. Um, and uh, so in this, uh, in this um, rotation, we are first going to um, roll by pi over 2. And so let's see how we uh, can represent that in uh, using a Tate Bryan rotation sequence. So roll, well, roll is just one of our uh, three um, rotations in the sequence. So we just leave yaw and pitch at 0, and we roll um, from 0 to pi over 2. So that's straightforward. Um, so the first half of this maneuver goes from 0, 0, 0 to 0, 0, pi over 2. And then in the second half of the maneuver, um, we're going to pitch um, by pi over 2. So the first half rolled by pi over 2, and the second half we're going to pitch by pi over 2. So you have to be careful here. We're not going to just be changing beta. What we're going to be doing is describing the orientations, the successive orientations in the second half of the maneuver, um, as if we got there via a yaw, then pitch, then roll maneuver. Okay, so we're going to start in the 0, 0, 0 configuration, um, and the first half of the rotation sequence, uh, I mean, the, of the maneuver, um, just goes like that. Um, but then in the second half of the maneuver, we're going to begin pitching up. So how can we get to this position if we, instead of doing what we described in the maneuver, if we did yaw, then pitch, then roll? And how we would get there is first yaw, then don't do any pitch, um, then roll. And uh, so um, we would uh, be changing the yaw variable, which is the alpha variable here. Beta would stay at zero. The alpha would uh, increase a little bit. We'd yaw a little bit more, then roll. And finally, we would yaw all the way, then roll. And so our alpha variable would increase from zero to pi over two. 
our beta stays at zero, and for the second half of the maneuver, um, our gamma stays at zero. So that's how we can describe what's going on here um, in terms of um, the 3, 2, 1 um, Tate Bryan rotation sequence. Let's now look at using um, the 3, 1, 3 Euler rotation sequence and describe the same maneuver. And again, we're going to consider this rotation sequence in the intrinsic setting, where each rotation is described in terms of a rotation from the orientation left off by the previous rotation. So intrinsic. And uh, so alpha, beta, and gamma in this case correspond to something different. Alpha, beta, and gamma, the first, second, and third rotations of this rotation sequence, corresponds to yaw, then roll, then yaw again. And again, we're going to start at the 0, 0, 0 configuration. And um, the first half of the maneuver it corresponds to a roll by pi over 2, which is now the second variable, beta. <coughs> so as the rotation goes along, we're going to go from 0, 0, 0 to 0, pi over 2, 0. Same argument as before, just a different variable. Um, and once we get from there, um, then we want to describe the second half of the maneuver, which is going that way, but um, in the uh, um, Im imagining that we are yawing, then rolling, then yawing again. And so, same argument as before. We yaw, then we roll, then we yaw, then we roll, and finally we yaw by pi over 2, and then we roll. The same argument as before, just different variables. And so, our alpha variable um, corresponds to our first yaw, and so we're going to um, increase the alpha from 0 to pi over 2, and the beta is going to stay at pi over 2, and the yaw again is going to stay at 0. And so that's the description of this maneuver um, using um, 313 rotation sequence. So now I want to describe this using quaternions, and uh, we'll consider this description in an, in an extrinsic setting. meaning that we're going to fix the coordinate system um, to the aircraft. So again, right-handed coordinate system fixed to the aircraft. And we're going to describe each successive rotation using that initial coordinate system. So the X is that was pointing out the nose, the Y pointing out the right wing, and the Z pointing down um, is going to stay fixed now. I'm going to describe I in the X uh, direction, um, J in the Y direction, and K in the Z direction. And those are going to remain fixed in space, and we're going to describe the two halves of this maneuver using rotations about this I, J, and K. And so um, we're going to start with a rotation, uh, a roll, so a rotation about the I, uh, I axis by pi over 2. So we're going to start with a rotation axis U1 of I and a, uh, a theta 1, uh, the amount we're going to rotate by, is going to be pi over 2. And we're going to define phi, as we uh, described last time, um, as uh, so phi 1, um, as being uh, just theta over 2. So that's going to be pi over 4. And then our q1, our quaternion that we'll use for the first rotation, um, is uh, simply going to be um, e to the u1 um, phi. And so we're going to uh, calculate, um, calculate this. So we have cos phi plus um, u1 times sine phi. And uh, phi is equal to uh, pi over 4. Um, and so uh, cos phi and sine phi are just square root of 2 over 2. And so this is just equal to um, the square root of 2 over 2 
um, times one plus um, the u vectors in the i direction, so one plus i. So that's our quaternion that we'll use to apply the rotation. And then the second rotation, um, so after we roll by pi over two, then using our original coordinate system, we're now going to yaw, and so that corresponds to rotating about the um, k direction, the, the, the z axis. We're going to rotate um, uh, by pi over two, positive pi over two degrees. And so our u2 for our second rotation uh, is going to be the k direction, and we're again going to rotate by um, pi over two. And so our phi is going to be um, theta 2 over 2, which is just going to be pi over 4 again. And so our q2, our second quaternion that we will use for our second rotation, will be e to the um, u2 phi 2, um, which is going to be um, cosine of phi 2. Sorry, I dropped some ones. Um, uh, plus u2 times sine of phi2, which is going to be square root of 2 over 2 times 1 plus, now our u is k. All right, and so then the overall rotation, um, so q, the overall rotation, um, is going to be given by um, q2 times q1. Remember, the, the rotation that we apply first, we put on the right side, uh, and then we stack up the additional rotations to the left of that. Um, and this is non-commutative algebra, so if you wrote it down in the other order, you'd get something different, and that would be wrong. Okay, so we're going to go um, q2 times, uh, times q1, from the left to the right, if we write it that way. Um, and so we're going to have um, q2 times q1, square root of 2 over 2 times square root of 2 over 2 is just a half. And uh, so q2 is on the left, so 1 plus k times 1 plus i is going to give us um, 1 half 1 plus i plus k plus, get the order correct, k times i. And remember, k times i is just j using quaternion math. Um, and so um, let's write um, the, uh, the one half here. We can write that as um, cosine of pi over three um, is, is a half. So let me, instead of writing a half for the first time, let me write that as cosine of pi over three. And uh, the, uh, the other a half, let me write that as sine of pi over 3 over square root of 3, which is also a half. So that's for, perfectly valid to write down. Um, sine of pi over 3 um, over square root of 3 times um, the vector um, i plus, this is j, so let me write it as i plus j plus k. Okay, so um, we can think of this as cosine of, uh, of um, phi plus sine of phi times u. So let me lump the square root of 3 with this vector. That becomes a unit vector. So our phi is pi over 3. So in other words, our theta for the overall rotation is twice that, 2 pi over 3. And our overall u um, is i plus j plus k over square root of 3, which is a unit vector. Um, i plus j plus k over square root of 3, um, which is a unit vector. So that's the um, overall rotation corresponding to uh, um, the, the two rotations described as a quaternion um, for this maneuver. So now I want to do um, the same sort of description, but for this second maneuver. And we'll see that this uh, is a little bit more delicate because as we go through the rotation sequences in this case, we're going to go through singular conditions. So to begin with, to describe a singular uh, 
uh, reference frame that you're already used to. Imagine thinking about your position on the Earth in terms of latitude and longitude. Most of the time when you're walking around on the Earth, you take an epsilon size step, your latitude and longitude change by a very small amount. But imagine you're at 90 degrees west longitude and you're very close to the North Pole. So you're at a latitude of 89.99999 degrees and then you step towards Russia, an epsilon sized step over the North Pole. Suddenly your longitude changes from 90 degrees west longitude all the way around to 90 degrees east longitude. So your longitude changes by 180 degrees just for an epsilon size step. And in fact, when you're on top of the North Pole, your longitude is undefined. You could be in many different configurations and all of them, uh, all of those longitudes would still describe where you are. So that's called a singular orientate, a, a singular reference frame that at that point, the North Pole, the description of where you are is non-unique. There are many different ways of describing where you are. And that can be problematical um, if you're trying to set up a, a feedback control rule that's based on latitude and longitude and you move through an orientation where the longitude is undefined, you might encounter problems. So you can imagine when using a, uh, um, a uh, description in a automatic control rule, um, we don't want uh, to be going through um, singular points. And so we want to select our, uh, um, our, our coordinate systems that we uh, describe our locations if we're talking about motion on the earth or our orientations appropriately so we don't move through these singular conditions. So let's see what happens when we encounter singularity um, with a, a, a description of orientation. So first we're going to describe this maneuver using a 3-2-1 date brine rotation sequence as before. And again considered in the intrinsic setting. And so, um, again, alpha, beta, and gamma, in this case, correspond to yaw, then pitch, then roll, and in an intrinsic setting. And again, we're going to start from the 0, 0, 0 orientation, which nominally might be the um, uh, pointing with my axes in the northeast down configuration. <coughs> and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my first half of the maneuver, which is pitch by pi over two. So pitch by pi over two. So we have yaw, pitch, and roll. Um, and pitch by pi over two, um, pitch is just our second variable in a three, two, one uh, tape brine rotation sequence. And so this just goes smoothly from zero, zero, zero to zero, pitching by pi over two, zero. No problems there. This turns out to be the singular condition though. There are many different ways to describe this position, this being one of them. Um, so this is like the North Pole, and we've come up to the North Pole like we were walking from Canada to the North Pole, and now we want to walk down the other side as if we're gonna go from uh, the North Pole down towards Russia coming down the other side. And so the problem is this representation um, is non-unique and there's no way by a small variation of these three uh, angles to describe a step from here down to here. So we have to use one of the other representations of this orientation. So our representation has to take a sudden jump from 0 pi over 2, 0 to let's see what else works. And so we can take a sudden jump from um, just 0 pi over 2, 0 to let's see if we yaw by pi over 2, then pitch by pi over 2, then roll by pi over 2, we get to the same configuration. So let's use that pi over 2, pi over 2, pi over 2 corresponds to the same orientation where we yaw, then we pitch, then we roll, and we get to this same intermediate condition here. Then from there, if we start from that, um, and then uh, yaw, pitch by something less than pi over two, and roll, and then yaw, pitch by something less than that, and then roll, and finally, yaw, don't pitch at all, then roll. That describes the second half of the maneuver. So the ha second half of the maneuver simply corresponds to the second variable, the, the, the pitch, reducing smoothly from pi over two down to zero.
Okay, so that's uh, how we describe um, what's going on uh, in this second maneuver using the 321 uh, Tate Bryan rotation sequence. Um, how about if we used the 313 Euler rotation sequence? Again, considered in an intrinsic setting. So um, again, 313 means the alpha corresponds to a yaw, the beta corresponds to a roll, and then the gamma corresponds to yaw again. And uh, we're going to start again nominally in the 0, 0, 0 orientation. And we're going to try to see how we can describe the first half of the maneuver, which is pitching by pi over 2. And you can't do it via just yawing a little bit um, and, uh, and rolling a little bit and yawing again. You can't get to the uh, configuration that corresponds to just pitching a little bit. So it's a problem. What we have to do is, again, make a jump in the representation of um, our, uh, our, our condition. So this turns out to be the singular orientation in the 313 Euler rotation sequence um, and uh, the 0, 0, 0 representation here. And uh, so we need to jump um, from describing that as 0, 0, 0 to describing that as yaw by pi over 2 don't do any roll, and then yaw again by pi over 2. So we're going to jump from 0, 0, 0 to pi over 2, 0, minus pi over 2. So we yaw again coming back, and we're again at that condition. Yaw, don't do any roll, yaw back. Now, if we start from that description, then if we uh, yaw and then roll a little bit, and then yaw again, and, and we're starting again, it's an intrinsic representation, so we start from this yawed and slightly rolled configuration, and yaw again, it brings us back to this nose-up attitude. Um, and so as we go through the first half of this maneuver, after we make this jump, our um, roll variable is going to change smoothly from zero to something larger than zero um, to um, eventually if we um, roll all the way by pi over 2 and come up, then we uh, get to, uh, to the final, uh, to, to the intermediate condition after the end of the first half of the maneuver. So we go to pi over 2, pi over 2, minus pi over 2. And so the first half of the maneuver after this jump corresponds to the roll, the, 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 the one. <coughs> <coughs> so the intermediate state rolling um, from, uh, fr from 0 to pi over 2. So the, the beta changing smoothly um, and the other two variables uh, staying constant. And then the second half of the maneuver um, is uh, simply, um, so after we pitch by pi over 2, then we want to describe how we yaw from there down to that state, so that's the second half of the maneuver. And to describe that using our rotation sequence, we're going to yaw, then roll, and then yaw again by some amount which is less than pi over 2, which describes us as we're coming back there. Um, and so minus pi over 2 is going to increase gradually to 0 um, to describe the second half of the maneuver, pi over 2, pi over 2, 0 is where we will wind up. So that's how we describe the 313 Euler uh, rotation sequence um, uh, of this maneuver. And we have our jump in the uh, right from the initial condition rather than our jump uh, halfway across. And see that the, uh, the final state here is the same as the final state here as uh, the um, final state here was the same as the final state there. All right, so we got to the same final state um, in two different ways. When we did this maneuver, we didn't encounter either of these singular conditions. And so the yaw pitch and roll and the yaw roll, yaw again representations varied smoothly. Whereas when we uh, were doing this maneuver, it so happened that we went through both of those singular conditions. Um, but uh, So we have to do a jump in the representation, um, in this case here, in this case here. But again, we get to the same final state um, as we did before. So now let's describe this second maneuver uh, using quaternions.
And again, we're going to consider this in the extrinsic setting. And uh, so um, we're going to locate our coordinate system um, on the body, our right-handed coordinate system at the center of the mass of the body. And then our I is going to be out the nose, the J is going to be out the left wing, and the K is going to be down. But we're going to leave that sense of where I, J, and K are fixed throughout the entire maneuver um, in the extrinsic setting. And we're just going to describe rotations using standard quaternion rotation descriptions as we did before. Um, and so if we're going to pitch by pi over 2, that corresponds to um, a rotation by pi over 2 about the J axis. Um, and so we're going to initially take our U1 as being J and our theta1 as being pi over 2. And uh, our, our phi1 as being, sorry, our uh, theta1 as being pi over 2. And so our phi1 has been theta1 over 2 is equal to pi over 4. And we'll describe our q1 um, as being um, e to the u1 phi1. Um, and so that's going to be cos phi1 plus i, uh, I'm sorry, plus u times sine phi1. And so uh, cosine and, and sine of, of pi over 4 is just square root of 2 over 2. And so we have a 1 plus u1, and our u1 is j here. Okay, so that's our q1. Um, and then our second rotation um, in the maneuver. Um, so after we've pitched by pi over 2, we're going to yaw by pi over 2. And yawing by pi over 2 just corresponds to rotation about the i axis by pi over 2. Um, and so remember, extrinsic. So our coordinate system started out with x that way, and now we're going to be yawing about that vector. So our u2 is equal to i. Our theta 2 is equal to pi over 2. So our phi 2 is equal to uh, theta 2 over 2, which is equal to pi over 4. And so our q2, which is just uh, e to the u2 times phi 2, um, is going to be cos phi 2 plus u2 sine phi 2. Uh, it's equal to simply uh, cos phi 2 again is square root of 2 over 2, so sine phi 2 times 1 plus, um, and our u2 vec is, uh, is, is just i, so we have 1 plus i. And uh, so now our overall q is just equal to um, q1 is the first thing that we applied. And the second thing we apply, we put to the left of it. So q2 times q1, writing it the other way would be incorrect. So q2 times q1. And so we have q2, q2 times q2, q1. So square root of 2 over 2 squared is just a half. And so we have uh, q2 is 1 plus i times q1 is 1 plus j. Multiply those together, um, we get one half times one plus i plus j plus i times j in that order. And i times j is equal to k using quaternion math, right? Um, and so we can write this as a half is cosine of pi over 3 as before. pi over 3. And uh, then um, a half can be written as sine pi over 3 over square root of 3. And then times the vector i plus j plus k. So again, we see that our theta is twice phi. So our overall angle that we've rotated about is theta is equal to twice phi is 2 pi over 3. 
and our U that we're rotating about, um, pull this over here, um, is this unit vector I plus J plus K over square root of 3. So, same result as we got before. And uh, so, <coughs> we see that um, the quaternion representation does not go through any singular uh, points, um, though both the tate brine and the Euler rotation sequences did through this maneuver. In fact, um, in all of the rotations that you could possibly do uh, with the solid body, the quaternion representation never encounters a singularity. Um, and so uh, it's quite useful then for using it when you're developing feedback control rules for, for controlling a solid body because you're gonna, never going to have these sudden jumps as we do with rotation sequences. But if you're describing a uh, transport aircraft and we're in some small perturbation from the flying forward condition, using, for instance, yaw, pitch, and roll, a tate Bryan rotation sequence is very natural uh, because we're never in normal operations of the aircraft going to get anywhere near that singular point. Maybe a high-performance fighter aircraft um, is, uh, is a different uh, consideration, um, but, uh, but for a, uh, a normal transport aircraft, um, a, a 3 2 one tate Bryan rotation sequence is entirely adequate, and it's perhaps a little more intuitive, thinking in terms of yaw, pitch, and roll, rather than thinking of Rodriguez's rotation theorem embedded within um, a quaternion description of some vector and rotating about that vector to get where you're going. Um, and so, depending upon uh, the, the size of the maneuvers and whether or not you want to be non-singular all over the orientation space or not, um, helps you to decide between quaternions and rotation sequences and um, where you are uh, nominally operating about um, allows you to pick between different uh, rotation sequences. So if you're going to use a rotation sequence, for instance, for an aircraft, 3 to one would be a great choice. 3 one 3 Euler rotation sequence would be a, a, a less good choice because you're starting out right at the singular condition. And so every time you had a minor perturbation in the wrong direction, you're going to have to do this jump. Um, and so this would be a poor choice for an aircraft. This would be a good choice for an aircraft. Um, if you're describing some other um, solid body, for instance, a spinning top, uh, this particular rotation sequence, 3 on 3, um, turns out to be a very good choice. All right, so so far what we've done is we've discussed um, different um, ways of representing um, orientation um, as rotations from a re reference, uh, reference orientation, and those rotations can be represented um, either as um, three rotations about the, uh, the axes done in an intrinsic setting, and we've considered one possible case of the Tate Bryan and one possible case of the uh, of the Euler rotation sequences, um, or as a um, ex extrinsic representation, um, essentially embedding Rodriguez's rotation formula into a quaternion, uh, and then using quaternion math uh, to to represent the rotations. And we see that successive rotations can be combined together um, and uh, give us a consistent description. Different maneuvers arrive at the same final orientation. What we need need to do next uh, is to figure out um, how these um, representations of orientations evolve in time um, and specifically how they evolve in time when forces and torques are applied to the body um, in order to get to a dynamic description um, of how the orientation of the vehicle changes in time um, as, uh, as forces are and torques are applied and we'll discuss that in the in upcoming video.